we have an awesome group of folks that we're going to be coming at this question of managing up from a bunch of different angles and aspects depending on your role and where you sit in revenue organization um, as we kick things off um maybe we can do a quick round of intros here and also feel free to engage with us in the turn this off as we start focus mode there we go um i'll start things off with a quick intro so i'm ross ceo and co-founder of accord and a bit about my background i spent about five years helping scale out the stripe sales organization from about three of us to 350 um which was a journey and definitely lots of managing up required in uh in that and before then was in the music industry but that's for another master class um and then maybe the icebreaker where we're calling in from and uh i love this last time so i gotta do it again because my answer is going to change what advice would you give your 20 year old self as you're kicking off your professional career um, I think I said have more patience last time, but I'm not sure if that would help. Um, I think I would have doubled down on building great relationships with colleagues and just other people. You never know how that's going to pay off down the road. And, you know, you're so focused on just doing your thing and like becoming a pro at what you're doing early on. You kind of forget that. And I think investing in that earlier probably would have paid off a bunch. Um, so feel free to drop. Um, <laughs> yeah. Drop that in, in, in By Microsoft. Chat. By yeah, Apple. Yeah. Um, also, your chat is probably going to default to hosts and panelists. So we're getting some great replies here. Feel free to change it to everyone if you want to share. Um, Pete, I'll pass it off to you next. Yo, uh, what's up, people? My name is Pete Kazanji. I am the founder and CRO of Atrium. Uh, Atrium makes data driven sales management software. So it's software that uh, helps sales managers. Um, AE, SDR, AMCSM, sales leaders use data and metrics to improve the performance of their, their teams. Um, super easy to set up, takes about five minutes to just like sign in with your Salesforce credentials and presto change, you have a world-class metrics harness being analyzed for you and kind of reporting out information to you and be like, hey, look over here. Hey, look over here. Um, I'm based in San Francisco here. And then the advice I would say to probably like my 20-year-old self um, would, would probably be just like, actually, in fairness, it would probably be like learn how to sell like <laughs> sooner um, because that definitely like took me a hot second. Um, I... I I'm a business generalist founder by background as a product manager at VMware when I started my career, product manager, and product marketer, excuse me. Um, and um, and like I only got into sales when I was like 31 or so. And I, I had to be the first seller at my last software company, um, first seller for sales manager and kind of went from like having misconceptions around sales to like being like, actually, this is just about like human persuasion and communication, things that impact everything in your life. So. That would kind of be my, my, my answer there. Some, some good advice, Pete. And how about yourself, Bilal? Hey, everybody. Bilal here, Death to Fluff. I'm the head of go-to-market at GTM Buddy, which is a just-in-time sales enablement tool that gives enablers um, a nice little window into their seller's world so they can give them actual good enablement that help them close deals instead of uh, checkbox enablement that uh, leads you astray makes you feel like it's a waste of time. And uh, I, I'm in Atlanta, by the way. And I think for me, my 20 year old self, this is actually really, I've been thinking about this question, I probably would have told myself not to chase the money and um, chase the career growth instead. And I was I've been in sales my entire career for 12 years now. And I made decisions in my 20s for better paychecks. And I think I could have done better had I just stuck around a little longer and not chased the money. Now I did make good money, so <laughs> it didn't. The grass didn't is hurt. always greener. <laughs> but yeah, but I think <laughs> I think it would have made sense to stick at a company for three, four, five years, uh, forgo a little bit of extra cash that I made switching or chasing the bigger enterprise paychecks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that would have been a better choice overall. There. And Adam, to round us out. Good morning, good afternoon. Adam Boucher, I am the CRO at Phoenix, and we are a payments infrastructure company, and we serve uh, vertical software platforms and help embed payments acceptance capabilities into those platforms. I lead all the 
go to market uh, pieces of the business here from marketing to sales development, sales, customer success, rev ops, et cetera. Prior to Phoenix, spent most of the last decade at Google, um, this little small business called Google Cloud. When I started, <laughs> less than 500 people and maybe $100 million in revenue. When I left, we were doing $8 billion in revenue and had 28,000 employees and had a variety of different uh, sales leadership roles there, both in the U.S. and EMEA. So did you say 28,000 from 500? 28,000 people. So it was quite a wild ride during that period of time. Yeah. Well, I guess you got probably some good advice for us on the topics today. Sure. Hopefully. We'll see. Um, what would I advise my 20 year, 20 year old self? I, I think two things. One is probably would have gotten into tech sale, you know, tech sales and, and, uh, a lot earlier. It took me a good decade or so to figure out that that's, that's where it's all happening. And two is early in my career. I looked at sales as very much relationship oriented, mm-hmm. involved quite a bit over the last 20 years where mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a really high balance of art and science. And I think science is actually more important today than just the relationship piece. And the best sellers will also be great operators and they'll follow a, uh, you know, a process that's proven and consistent. And I, I wish I would have learned that earlier in my career. Yeah, totally. I'm calling in from Denver. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, to kind of shift gears back from us to the topic at hand, managing up for sales managers and leaders, a few topics we're going to cover, how to stand out to leadership by being proactive, uh, best practices on setting expectations and aligning with execs and tips for communicating effectively and getting buy-in on your ideas. Three topics that I feel like today I'm going to personally learn a lot about things that I was not necessarily great at my days at Stripe and still very much a work in progress that my team members would all test to at Accord. Uh, So hoping to learn a few things from this panel. Um, and the audience as well. Hopefully this is a very engaging session where there is some Q&A and some comments from y'all out there, 34 folks tuning in so far, hopefully some more to join in the next few minutes. Um, Well, to kick things off, Pete had a great idea to get oriented because this can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, very general topic. Um, Maybe to kick things off, Pete, if you wanna help us, uh, you know, think about what does managing up mean maybe to you and maybe some ideas of what it could mean to some other folks and why it's so important as, you know, revenue leaders. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that the way to think about um, managing up in general is, um, is, is, is like information distribution, right? Because organizations, what you're, like what an organization does is it's like an agglomeration of folks that are like doing actions that are supposed to create business value, right? And so the mechanism by which we do that is by having people aligned. <laughs> right. And so what that means, that can mean handoff stuff like SDR to AE to AM, CSM or whatever. But it, what, but another thing is that it also means aligning up. And so you have like expectations that potentially go down, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Hey, you know, these, these are quotas, or this is like, you know, what we're, what we're expecting people to hit at or, or whatever. And then there's information that needs to go back up, if you will, to, to make sure that folks can be aware if there's like either a, Probably the more important thing is like if there are shortfalls or negative surprises, those are the sort of things that people want to be aware of much more quickly. Um, And so that just kind of cascades, right? So like, you know, individual contributor communicating up, whether that's like spoken communication, written communication, or we do a lot of reporting and like CRM maintenance, um, database maintenance in order to make it such that this information can kind of like permeate itself. So like those things can be done by an IC. They can also be done by a manager. So like managing up to your to your VP of sales. And then also like one of the things I always joke about is everyone's got a boss. You think the founder's the boss? No, no, no. Founder's got a boss. <laughs> it's called a board, right? DC's got a boss. It's called LPs, right? Everyone's got a boss. And so like you just have to think about keeping your boss in the loop on, you know, on expectations on alignment and like especially like you know being early and often around like negative surprises completely um yeah that it means a lot of different things we're going to talk about it from i think trying to pick a few of those examples um a lot what does it mean to you and why do you think it's so important for for revenue leaders 
I mean, because the thing is, we we have this perception in our minds that um, sales is a is a numbers game, but it's it's extremely emotional, just like in anything else. Um, like as a seller, you just assume if I hit quota, all things good happen to me, and that's just not how it works. Because people people are irrational and they make irrational decisions, and just because you're the number one rep doesn't mean you're going to get promoted, and and just because uh, you know you're doing what you think you're supposed to do in activity doesn't mean. Um, you're not going to be put on PIP in a quarter. It's just like the reality is when you can master the skill of managing up, you are giving yourself um, a very great way to ensure some longevity in your career, to finally bear the fruits of efforts that you put in because sales is a compounding um, type of role where it it keeps getting better and better. The more activities you do, that's a compounding effect on the follow-ups and things that happen downstream from that. And those are all good things for you personally, and it's good things for your company. So managing up helps you stay there longer and and see the fruits of that labor, which is what we all really want. Totally. Yeah. I can think of a few um, areas I, where I fell short on that. Uh, I, I, I think a key thing that Bilal calls out there, especially around like the activity thing. So this is one of the things that like we see with Atrium with our customers is like, you know, we help organizations use metrics to kind of be more aware, like managers be more aware of what's happening to their teams, leaders all the way up, right? The problem was like, like if you're a rep and you just assume that your manager like is on top of that, like (laughs) I got news for you, (laughs) right? Even if like you have the dopest metrics harness in place in the world, you still have to be a good advertiser, right? Of your own efforts. Um, and like, you know, say like, think about it selling internally, right? Like packaging that up and like making sure that it's like being, you know, being consumed versus being like, oh yeah, I'm sure my manager's looking at the activity dashboard. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Mutual alignment, not just in deals, but internally. And that's something that I completely. I'm sure the prospect the talked in. to I'm sure the prospect talked to the economic buyer for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He said he was gonna. He said, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, I trust him. <laughs> and, and and Adam, what does this mean uh, to you both of your experience? Obviously, you know, going from 500 to 28,000, a lot of alignment and glue needing to happen there. And then obviously at Phoenix now with a rapidly scaling go to market organization that you're in charge of, what does it, you know, what does it mean to you and why do you think it's so important? Yeah, I'll take a, a little bit of a different spin on it is I think when I was a frontline seller, I always looked at managing up as, you know, I'm reporting to my manager so that they know what I'm doing. Yeah. And now that I'm in a, an executive role, I realize that that's not the intent at all. Um, we're making decisions based, you know, for, uh, on the strategy of the organization. You know, we're making decisions on how to build our products so that it meets our customers' needs more effectively. And managing up is important because that's where we get the information in order to make strategic decisions, in order to better solve the customer needs. And ultimately, if we have that information, we're going to help the sellers be more successful because we're building products and solutions that are more value-based, that are going to be easier to sell on the market. They're going to have a better time and easier time hitting their quotas. They're going to make more money. And so I think it's important to be able to give that visibility of what's working what's not working. So as a leadership team, we can continue to enhance the business to make the overall business and our customers more successful. Yeah. Yeah. I think like oftentimes folks, it kind of goes to like the bad news situation. Oftentimes folks are afraid of sharing bad news, but like essentially like as a manager, as a leader, we are like sales operations, right? One of the things I like to talk about is that like we as like sales leaders and sales operations folks are like the product manager, uh, product managers of the sales organization. And so like, if like say a new campaign is just like not performing and like bringing in a bunch of like dog shit ops, like don't just sit there and grump right to yourself excuse me share it and be like hey here's this thing that i'm observing here right and communicate that to adam such that adam can then like get with marketing right and be like hey did you guys like change targeting criteria or or something like that so it's essentially it's like sending information back up to folks who are responsible for that, whether that's like, you know, a problematic forecast or a program that's not working or, you know, like a process issue, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think importantly, like, A, you can do it asynchronously. 
ideally what you're doing it is in a, a very reasoned way where it's like, hey, Adam, what I'm seeing here is in the last like six months, op inflow has descended by this amount right here. And I think the reason why that's happening is because these lead sources are underperforming as compared to the, the it used to be versus being like, ah, oh, the leads are weak or whatever, like showing up in a very, versus just like a one-off kind of like rando Slack message versus like a very reason, like well-reasoned communication to Adam or to whoever else. That's actually very powerful to Adam as a, as a leader. And also to Bilal's point earlier, makes you look pretty rad as a rep or as a manager in that case, right? Mm -hmm. And let me, let me just piggyback off of bad news. It, it's going to come to the surface at some point. Yeah. The earlier, the better. If, yeah. if it's too late, and let's just use a, a deal, right? We're, we're working on a deal mm -hmm. and we're finish line. And all of a sudden we learn about all this information that's going to be a blocker for us to win. And it's too yeah. late in the sales cycle. And we've already lost. If the bad news is presented early in the sales cycle, we can make adjustments. Two things. Right. We can plan. We can we can change our strategy to better position ourselves to win. And I think it's important to know bad news is OK as long as it's presented at the right time. Yes. Being proactive. And that's one of the things that I want to dig into, because I think that's the key to managing up is the pace of it. And when things come up, because I think it can be you just set out, it can be really frustrating to be managed up very late on things that should have been evident earlier. Um, so maybe if we, one thing that just came to mind, maybe we can go around and maybe one or two things, maybe uh, a tip that you've picked up or you've seen other people do in terms of managing up that you, you know, either want to replicate or have started to do yourself. And maybe one thing that you used to do that you identified as part of your career is like, oh, that wasn't awesome. How I was interacting with other folks in my org. I can think of one not great one when you brought up the example of bad leads. I think, um, you know, obviously if you're at a high growth company, um, growing pains, I think I got really frustrated at one point when we were scaling our team really quickly and felt like there wasn't awesome enablement and processes built out. And we were kind of leaving, like our ramp times were like very long and feel like there could have been a lot more to do with reps earlier. And a lot of it fell on a few folks that kind of had figured it out. And they were being asked now, as part of their job, 100% quote, they, you know, with full quota to support them. It was like, hey, if you want other, other people can be selling this well, but I feel like we could be doing a lot more. And I approached it less so from thinking about them as stakeholders and deals and how I'd approach that. And from a place of frustration and like, I think a very selfish way of like, this is how it's hurting me, figure it out instead of as a stakeholder, I understand this is what you're trying to accomplish. You're trying to get the most out of every rep because you're paying them this, blah, blah, blah. Hey, this is what I've seen. This is a few suggestions. So that's one thing that I can think about being very, very, you know, me centric versus in a deal, how the best reps would think about it is as key stakeholders in something they're trying to accomplish and influence. Um, I think something that I've picked up that I found really helpful. Um, someone actually mentioned this when I was posting about this, this masterclass is just the weekly few bullets of things that you've noticed, even if they're not responded to, is incredibly, incredibly helpful for anyone that's above you that's trying to get closer to the customer and what's happening day to day on calls and in the market. People notice that it takes very little time. It's very much appreciated. They might not engage with it in a way, but it's going to completely transform their perspective of you as a potential strategic leader at the company, even if it doesn't feel that way. So those are kind of two things that that stand out to me, but would love to hear anyone else's kind of learnings and mistakes that they've made. Yeah, I'll I'll throw uh, a practice that out that we use at Phoenix today, and, and we have a memo culture, and we believe that writing things down um, really sharpens our thought process. And every week we'll we'll write memos, and so the AEs will write a memo, the sales leaders will write a memo, the functions will write a memo. We're basically summarizing three things: uh, what went well that week, what didn't go well that we need to change and what's up next. And it's a two page memo so that we have visibility and we can draw um, you know, parallels and see signals on things that we're doing in the market. Maybe an AE got a win and talked about what went well. So that's information that can be distributed to other folks on the team that they can start to leverage those best practices. Or we're starting to see a you know, product gap 
you know, across five customers. Like, okay, we should probably talk about how that gets prioritized. What's the TAM for that? And then up, what's up next allows us to ensure we have the right resources at the table to give the team the support that they need to advance whatever the initiative is they are trying to advance. And I found that to be a great way to communicate and to provide that level of visibility um, in a scalable way. Yeah, async written stuff, especially now with everyone remote. Totally understand. Sorry, I just saw you went off uh, went off mute there. Well, I'll go for it. Well, I, I I think I have much more uh, things that I've done wrong than right. I'm managing up over my career, but I'll, I'll throw out a couple that just totally I would not advise doing it. Number one is I would never advise like whiteboarding or using your manager as a sounding board uh, when they're not expecting it. Like a, this is a, just a terrible idea. The problem is whatever you're fixated on as an employee is just one piece of a much bigger puzzle that they're probably looking at or dealing with, even if it's only one level above you. And especially then if it's two or three levels above you. And so it's like, we have this tendency as human beings in psychology to get um, like recency bias, like something happens to us. So we get start getting obsessed with it. And our like cone of attention is just stuck on that. And you assume then that everybody else must be thinking about that thing too. So you go and think you're going to like jam board on this like problem and your manager just like, this is not what I want you doing. And I don't really care. It's a, it's a great way to not manage up. So that's one that I've learned the hard way. And another one I've learned the hard way is that, um, uh, man, there's such a fine line between a manager telling you, of course, my door is open. Of course, you can come tell me what's going on and what they actually want you to do. So it's like you get told that like, yes, please bring me the problems or yes, please tell me what's going wrong. But they don't want you to complain. And so there's this like way you have to do it. And there's a lot of finessing to it, quite frankly, on how you're supposed to bring up it's like a deal, problem. right? But like you're not going to go to a customer and be like, your yeah. organization is shit at all this stuff and we're going to help. It's like, right. hey, if you're trying to accomplish this, and this is what I've heard from some people, and right. you know, we know other people struggle with these things, and we think we can help here. <laughs> right, right. And then, like, you have to, you have to really finesse it all, and you have to like not be all emotional about it, even though you are, because if it's a problem, it's probably your problem that you're bringing up, or a problem that you have with someone else, and it's just like, why do you want me to be calm about this? This is like really impacting me, and 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 that's not what they, that's not what they want. And so you'll hear this, like, I took it as face value. People are like, yeah, my door is always open. And I walk into that door and they're like, please leave. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? I thought the door is always open. What the hell happened here? So it's there, there's there, you know, your, your boss, manager, whoever they may be, is just as emotionally irrational as you and has their own fixations that they're thinking about. And so you you come in and it's really better just to have already thought it out and give them a very simple choice of A or B than to think that you're going to work it out with them and, um, and realize that you might put in a lot of effort into a thought that isn't something that they're even going to put time towards because they have other considerations that they're trying to manage. And none of this factors in the fact that you might just have a bad manager. And if you have a bad manager, there's not a lot of great managing up that you can do if they're the sort of personality. We've all maybe have seen this type of person that might take credit for others' ideas and not give it to them, or isn't the type that gives good feedback or doesn't create a lot of trust um, within it within the team. And then that situation is completely different. You wouldn't none of that stuff would really apply if you have that kind of a manager. Yeah, um, I think there's kind of two things that I would recommend here. One is um, like, I think there's kind of like a meta strategy here, which is just like set an intention around like, you know, uh, frequent co like communication with like, with your manager around these things. Um, this is actually one of the, so, you know, we make what we call data-driven sales management software that kind of helps with the math components of things, right? Like, you know, measurement and management using math but the, you still got to actually do like the management stuff, like the actual actions. And this is why what we, what we identified was that there isn't as much manager enablement on these topics as, as one would desire. And so this is what we actually uh, work with a gentleman named Richard Harris to do like monthly um, uh, both manager and also leader boot camps on, on this. Um, they're actually, it's just like free for our customers. And also we just make them available to the to the community as well, because um, it's virtual, <laughs> right? So lots of people can be on there. Um, I think we may actually share those, but I think like setting an intention around doing that is is really important. 
Um, and then the second thing is, I think also like, don't underestimate the ability to like set it and forget it. Where like, if there's like a key metric or a set of key metrics that are important that like, you know, whether it's a key initiative. So like maybe Adam is like, hey, you know what guys, we need to, um, our AEs need to do a lot more prospecting, right? We need to measure self-sourced op creation and also the activity associated with that. That's a key initiative that's going to be going on. It's actually should not, like it shouldn't be hard for your organization to instantiate what we like to call like a mini dashboard or like a mini, like, a, you know, a mini report on that, uh, like do it on a per manager basis and like organizational basis, just have that information like permeating right? Like set it and forget it because then what, rather than relying on somebody to be like, oh, you know what? I should tell Adam that like, you know, we have this like shortfall in the number of, you know, contacts in our CRM. It's like, it's just permeating, right? Like you can set it and forget it. And I think doing that can be really powerful. Totally. I think I saw a couple really great pieces of advice and kind of plus ones in the comments here from, from uh, James and, and Kristen. Yeah, being solution oriented versus problem focused. Obviously, people want to hear the problems, but like if you're closest to the problem, you might have a couple ideas of how to solve that, or at least your perspective, because they're going to have different ones. And that is also helpful data points of even if it's not necessarily the right solution or one that they're going to go with, it's a helpful data point tied to the problem if you're that person. And then, yeah, a couple options is awesome. Um, and then, yeah, love the idea about being proactive to own your career and own that narrative again like my mind is just going back to like deal management like adam mentioned like approach your career and approach yourself like you know like you have other stakeholders who matter in the organization instead of like hey i'm just like well i mentioned like i'm just going to absolutely crush it from activity perspective and and other it's just not because people aren't objective they are human creatures and you need to treat them as such and it's funny looking back i think we've all made the mistakes of not approaching it that way. I think the best sales leaders are very, and reps, both reps, managers, leaders are very objective and process oriented and stuff. You might not naturally think about career progression and managing up as more of the soft skills. Um, but I think the further people get in their careers, the more they realize that that is super, super important. And you should be owning that narrative yourself instead of letting your rep your champion pitch for you. You should be doing that <laughs> yourself. Um, Awesome. I think we might have time for one, one and a half more questions. Would love one of those to come from the audience. If anyone has any questions about this in their particular role or thinking about some of these questions around how to more effectively manage up, I think we decided to do this topic because it's incredibly timely. A lot of pressure on organizations. You see a lot of slack sometimes between different roles and things, and that's fine when everything's going well. Revenue and leads solve all problems. When leads are harder to come by, when meetings are pushed and rescheduled and no-showed, when it's harder to close deals, I think you see the need for this alignment go up dramatically. And you see why some people might be restructured and re-leveled in this time, and some people would be elevated. And it comes down a lot to how you're managing up and with your organization, which is kind of why we decided. So if anyone has thoughts around that, feel free to drop them in there or hit us up after. Um, but uh, okay, since no one jumped in, there, I was trying to buy time. Uh, <laughs> I think a topic. I, I, I will say one thing there. really quick though, because there was a word that came up earlier, and I'm forgive me, I don't know if it was um, Adam or Pete who said it, but around like advertising, and this like idea of how you have to broadcast yourself. Yeah. And it's something that um, comes really unnaturally to me because I am not that type of person and I don't like talking about myself and I've never been accused of being the life of a party, probably never will. So it's just not in my nature to broadcast what I'm doing. But there's this assumption that, well, if I'm just doing my job, people will know the results speak for themselves. It's just there, right? Like it's just there. And it's just not the case at all. If you have a manager that's managing, you know, three, four, five, six, 10 plus people, they're not looking at each individual's day in and day out. They're completely oblivious to that sort of stuff. And, and having strategic, I'm going to use the word like strategic broadcasting of certain things that, you know, that you're doing that you think are really important is really powerful, is really powerful. And it's just knowing the right amount to when to blow your own trumpet and just, you know, that plays a huge part in keeping your manager in the loop on what you're doing. 
And it's something that till today I say I still struggle with because there are times when I probably should have tooted the horn a little louder and I didn't. And other times where I tooted too loud and it was a bit too much. But there is something to say about managing your like image, the broadcast, the advertising that you do for yourself and your work, because you're just under the impression that if the results are there, then obviously I did a great job. And that's just not the case. That's not the case. Adam, when you're thinking about um, like, because everyone's got a boss, right? And yeah. when you're thinking about managing up to the, you know, the CEO, I imagine you, you go into the CEO of, of Phoenix um, or, or like, you know, through the CEO to the, uh, to the board, what are kind of the, the biggest things that you think about when, um, when managing up in that regard? Yeah, I, I always try to zoom out and start with what is the purpose of what we're trying to do? And it really helps calibrate me on like how to communicate, right? We, we've set a long-term strategy as a company. And then we break that long-term strategy down into milestones over, you know, that are more near term. And the, the communication is, is really important on like, how is what I'm doing as a revenue leader and then our people within the revenue organization aligning to that strategy that we're trying to execute against? Right, because if if it if we're not doing things that actually move the, the the needle for that, it doesn't matter. We shouldn't be doing that. And so I always try to think about what's the purpose, what are the the strategic objectives we're trying to achieve, and then communicate to Richie, our CEO, and our board like how we're progressing. You know, first off, what is our strategy to align to that? How what's our execution plan? How are we performing? Again, going back to what's going well, what's not working. You know, what are my recommendations, on how we can continue to, you know, get better in certain areas. So that's the lens I generally look through. And, and, uh, and I find those types of conversations go well. Um, when we're not aligning to the strategy, those are where we get off track and they're a little less uh, comfortable. Yeah, what, I think what, one thing that can oftentimes um, trip people up at kind of like higher level echelons, you know, these fancier problems that you have, Adam. Um, is you, like, as you get higher in organizations, what ends up happening is like, you have to manage by metric, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we have a, you know, and every two, like we just did our OKR exercise for the, for this quarter. Um, we like boiled and you're from Google, right? Like, and then, you know, we just, we did our, we like decomposed the, the O's into the relevant, uh, KRs yep. there. And like now those have been like, you know, created in a task and so on and so forth. And we have an every, for like, as a leadership team, we have an every two week meeting where we essentially just like go through, like where we give a narrative on like where we're at on those OKRs and like kind of tracking towards them. And, but like most of the time that's metrical. Right. And then the same can be true. Like when you go and you're, you're doing your board meeting cadence, like maybe every quarterly, every quarter or so, a lot of this stuff is all going to be metrics. It's going to be like ARR added. It's going to be like, you know, net dollar retention. It's going to be like usage, usage metrics. It's going to be new opportunities created. It's going to be like MQL SAOs, da, 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 da. And mm -hmm. I think the problem is, is that if you just like hand somebody just like a data packet and we're like, here you go, read the tea leaves that's very dangerous. And like, I mean, not only is it dangerous, it's also just like laborious, right? It's kind of yeah. similar to what we were like, we were joking about before with, with Bilal, where it's like, if you're relying on your manager to, to look at the activity dashboard and be like, oh, look, you're at the top of the leaderboard. It's like, you know, you're, you're, there's risk. There's risk in your deal there. Same here versus saying like, hey, here's the, like the data packet. And then by the way, here's the narrative that flows across that. Like, hey, let's just like go ahead and give context here. Like, Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to talk about the, like these themes of the last quarter here, and then get into the um, like the supporting specifics associated with that. If you like, one of the things I always joke about is that like computers are programmed via code, and then humans are programmed via words and narratives. And so, if you want to make sure that like the board or like the CEO or whoever is like getting it, you have to give them you know a narrative. It isn't bullshit, obviously. It's got to be backed up by by data. But like the data without the narrative, like it's going to be either a not consumed appropriately um, because it's like higher friction, or it might be like erroneously consumed. They might come to the wrong conclusion, which of mm -hmm. course is like even more problematic. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. Um, yeah, I think net net on a lot of this advice is how important context is yeah. to 
really providing context up, right? Is like, hey, you're seeing all these things. This is the data points. Let me help you join them because I, you gather an intuition being around all the things that whatever your level is, whether that's CEO, CRO, whether that is VP, whether that's manager, whether that's rep, you're gathering intuition because you, you have all of the thousands of data points that they have, you know, a dozen of, hey, this is what it means to me. Okay, then they can take those. Oh yeah, I can see how that does that and then up and up and up versus here, do more work. Here's a problem. Figure it out now with the very few data points that you have. And I think we assume being under whoever that person is, especially multi-levels underneath that person, you're the boss, you know, you're here to fix this thing for me. And I think that's the approach that I took and I think it's the wrong approach. And the new approach is, hey, I'm a sales rep here and I'm responsible for helping you frame this issue that I'm seeing. And here's a potential path forward based on my context. And it's a no ask, ask, you know, my favorite type of, you know, uh, email or ask to a leader is here's the stuff that I, I know that you need. And I'm not even going to ask. And it's fine if you don't even talk to me about it because I've done my job and people really freaking appreciate that mm -hmm. um, because it makes, makes it sure so that they get the information they need without having to spend a ton of time on it because the higher up you get, the crazier it is to prioritize. Uh, and I think that empathy isn't necessarily there, um, you know, from, from folks below. But uh, last couple minutes, maybe as a helpful one, I just saw this question come through. What's the best way to transform from a seller into a management position? I think this is a super common question. Maybe if everyone wants to take uh, either that from rep to manager, also, the other big question that I hear is how do you go from frontline manager to maybe a head of sales or VP sales or that more strategic role? Um, I'll hit maybe the, the second part with what I my thought is there. I think it becomes less so being an advocate for your team and more so being on the first team of the company. And I think it's a really hard transition for people to make. Mm -hmm. It becomes less about the deals less about the reps and their success and more about the company's success. And sometimes those all don't ladder up in the same level of prioritization. Um, thinking it through again, like your bosses, your boss's boss's mental model. Um, so that's my thought if you're looking to make that leap and having those types of conversations with your, with your boss. Yeah, I'll give uh, some thoughts on, on kind of evolving the career and, it, there's always a catch 22, right? You're a, man, a leader generally wants somebody who has management experience, but if you don't have management experience, how can you ever become a manager? So it's the chicken or egg. And my, my thought is first make your intentions known, right? Let people know that this is something that you're interested in pursuing, but also be able to articulate the why. And it's not just because I want to manage people. It's <laughs> what drives you that you want to actually do that and be able to tell that story in an articulate way and then act like an owner, lean in and take on responsibilities that aren't part of your core role and to exhibit the leadership skills that you have. And what you'll find is that, you know, your, the, your direct manager is always looking for help, right? I, I would never say no to somebody that wants to take something off of my plate, right? And the more small wins, that you can show the more credibility that you build. And then you start taking on more and more responsibility. You might be able to step into a team leader role. So um, that's what I did at my, when I was way back in the day at Iron Mountain, I kind of stepped into a sales enablement role. So I had, you know, dotted line reports, but I didn't have direct line reports and it allowed me to sharpen my management skills mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, be under my VP's wing for a while. And then I was eventually promoted to regional sales manager. And that was a path that I took, but, you know, take on more than you're comfortable with lean in. Um, don't just do work because it's going to get you paid. You know, there's, you know, th those uh, internships are going to pay off if you, if you take, take that responsibility on. So that'd be a little bit of advice I would share. Internships. I love it. Internal internships. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's really yeah. it. That's that. I, I, at a prior startup, we didn't have a, like a proper sales sync that was run because we had trans, uh, a lot of turnover in our sales leadership. And I just, 
did it. I just put it on the calendar, invited the sellers to come. I'm not their boss. So I can't make them show up, but I just tried to make that meeting extremely productive for everybody that came and, and helpful. And I thought deeply about what I would want when I would first started that I didn't get. And a lot of people on my team were newer. So I was trying to give them that. And it just became the de facto sales sync. And that was a way for me to show my leadership that I really, and I was telling them, I want to be in charge. Like I want, I want more responsibility. I want to take a step out of being a rep and, and, and manage. And that's how I was able to demonstrate it to them. I was just doing it proactively without anybody asking me, without looking for a pat on the back for it. And, and my colleagues, my peers were very happy for it. They were grateful for it. So when the time came to talk about a manager role, it was already done. It wasn't even like a thing that had to happen because everyone's like, yeah, that has been acting as our de facto manager in a sense over these, this period of time. And we wouldn't want anyone else but him. Um, so I, I think that's the way to do it. And, and, and the thing is, again, it's kind of better to ask for forgiveness and permission. I just put that on people's calendar and said, let's do this thing. And it didn't have to be a big thing. I didn't, I didn't want to go around and ask a bunch of permission for it. I just wanted people to see that it was something proactive, beneficial to the company. And that's a really great point that you make, Rasa. That was really more, that wasn't helping my quota. That wasn't really something specific for me, but that was just something that the company needed, the team needed. And I was, you know, I think that's the way to do it. That's how you want to approach it. Totally. Very well said. Start doing the thing. I think one of my realizations from working on the core the last three years has been how freaking busy managers then directors like how much more they take on and i didn't have that perspective as a seller and if you can fill in even in a small way that one task that one week how grateful your boss your boss's boss is going to be for that like you just don't have that perspective because they're holding it all up for everyone else and shielding them from that um yeah just how impactful that could possibly be uh, that's a really really great point and, and pete to round us out any parting thoughts or words of wisdom on this topic yeah, I mean, I think exactly what Bilal was saying is like, I'm just thinking of a couple of my reps who like the way that we started using Accord at Atrium was because one of our account executives, who's who's now one of our, who's now one of our sales managers was like, hey, like this is a big kid way of selling. And like, I'm just going to start doing this and, and prove this out. And, um, and then we're going to, and then eventually like we standardize across the, the rest of the team in that regard, because uh, Sean took the initiative to do that. We actually have that across our team. Like this is something I push on my team to do. And like, I think as a leader, what you can do is you can enable people to that, give them permission. Kind of like Bilal was saying, like ask for forgiveness. You can push it on people. Like I expect that you add features to our sales motion. Or like we joke about how our sales motion is software that we're always like constantly updating. Like upgrade, 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 right? And so th that might mean like, oh, there's a missing slide and instead of instead of it like, oh, there's a, a missing like objection handle slide right here. Hey, Pete, can you make that? Hey, um, may maybe you can, because <laughs> you have two meetings today and like, and like, look at your calendar, look at my calendar and uh, right. <laughs> and, and I think just like, you know, doing those like software updates to the sales motion, um, which are gonna be like, because that's ultimately what the manager is supposed to be responsible for. But, you know, look at their calendar and how much time they actually have to like update the software. Ooh. Yeah, much more high leverage to do it through their team if possible. But that's some next level managing. That's uh, hopefully where I get to someday. But yes, the best leaders, I think, very incredibly high leverage where they can accomplish their job through the team. You're empowering to do that, but uh, maybe that's for another session. <laughs> awesome. Well, appreciate everyone joining, especially folks on the panel. Though you have a few things on the calendar, as Pete mentioned, um, mm -hmm. the schedule is much appreciated. Everyone joined us live and everyone listening into this afterwards. Hopefully there are a few helpful takeaways or reflections that you made from the session on how to mo more effectively you know, manage up um and maybe even coach reps or leaders under you um to some of this stuff so appreciate you taking the time and uh yeah have a good rest of the day see Cheers you guys all. bye